You've seen this painting a million times. I've seen it a million times. But why? It's just a man and a woman in front of a house. What is so special about it? Why would anyone go to a museum to see this? If you feel as vexed as we do right now, fear not. We have the explanation you're looking for, so let's get into it. But before we begin, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. The year was 1930. The banks were failing, the stock market had just crashed, and the United States public was witnessing the Great Depression. The implosion of the economy was hitting the masses hard. In the meantime, a relatively unknown painter was struggling to get his painting admitted into the annual competition of American paintings at the Art Institute of Chicago. It won the Norman Wade Harris Bronze Award. You can guess by bronze title that it was third place. But if you count the cash prizes, it was really fifth. The painter received $300 for his troubles, which doesn't seem like a lot, but it would have meant a lot in a historic depression. Now, that would have been that, had it not been for the political and economic conditions of the country, people who saw the painting were divided. Ask yourself why. I say yourself because it will take us a while to get there, so hang on. Grant Wood, the painter who'd submitted the painting to the Art Institute of Chicago, had received his training there almost 15 years prior. In the city, he'd worked as a silversmith and a metal worker, and then moved back to Cedar Rapids, Iowa. As we know, artists can get antsy, so he packed up his bags and went to Europe. However, being in close proximity to modern art didn't help. He still disliked Cubism and a lot of other modern movements. He appreciated Impressionism, Pointillism, and New Objectivity, but he was particularly taken by the style of Northern Renaissance paintings, their crisp style and rhythmic lines. When he returned home from Munich in the late 1920s, he was feeling fresh and rejuvenated. He settled back into his life in Iowa. Now, that would have been that, but one day he noticed something. While driving around with another painter in the town of Eldon, he saw the Dibble House, this old thing, wood, thought it a form of borrowed pretentiousness, a structural absurdity to put a Gothic-style window in such a flimsy frame house. Those were the words of his biographer, Daryl Garwood. I'm sure you're thinking, now that you've said it, I see it, even if you don't. The house's weird dimensions come from the Carpenter Gothic style, the American take on European Gothic architecture, but seeing it on this small house in the middle of nowhere was a little off-putting. After quickly sketching the house on the back of an envelope, he asked the residents for permission to paint it. He then did an oil painting and decided to improve upon it, because God knows it needed improving. So he asked himself what kind of people would live in this old house with flimsy Gothic styling. I have no idea why he needed to ask that when he'd already met the owners. Still, he needed models, so he chose. His sister, Wood's sister, dressed up in a colonial print apron to better represent the rural American lifestyle. Another important thing to mention here, well, maybe not important, but definitely interesting, his sister was called Nan, not affectionately. It's weird to name a baby Nan, but she lived to 101 years, so maybe the parents were onto something. For the male model, he chose his dentist, you know, like we all do. He dressed him up in old-school attire as well to echo tin types from my old family album. With the two models looking like old-school farmers, he started painting. After painting the two in separate settings because he didn't want his sister to roast him in front of Byron McKeeby, the dentist. He handed them props to further sell their rural personas and elongated their faces to go with the Gothic architecture. The result is a surprisingly well-painted work. Just look at the woman's head and how it rhythmically mimics the shape of the window behind her. Look at her clothing and how the pattern of the window drape matches it. Now, let's move on to the man's pitchfork. Notice the mirroring greases on his clothing and the house behind. By using several vertical lines, the painting almost mocks the house, the grandeur of Gothic architecture mapped on such a small structure. Some might say he appreciates it, but forget about the details for a second and look at the broader picture. What feeling does the painting convey? It's slightly intimidating to see a man with a pitchfork staring at you with a young woman by his side. Who is she, his wife or daughter? The woman's puritanical look emphasizes the rural lifestyle. Meanwhile, the hardworking farmers stare unnerved city folk. And here we arrive at the reason why it attracted controversy when it was exhibited. Some people saw it as an expression of small-town innocence, the diligent working class sticking to old-school principles. 
At a time when the nation was suffering through one of its worst crises, the reference to good old American values seemed very timely. Just 50 years before the painting's exhibition, more than half of Americans were working on farms. Now, with urban migration, industrial progress, and an increasing entrepreneurial drive, everything had changed. With the Great Depression looming over their heads, Americans had a lot of time for reflection, and the painting provided ample impetus for socio-political discourse. The pitchfork was a symbol of country folk's work ethic, and the assertiveness of the figures demonstrated the pride they took in their little routines and rituals. The painting was in newspapers everywhere, Chicago, New York, Indianapolis, Boston, and Kansas. When it was published in the Cedar Rapids Gazette, the locals were outraged. This is not how we look. He painted us like we were dum-dums. Can you believe this? Hmm. A lot of Iowa housewives started a letter-writing campaign, insisting that they did not look like the woman from the painting. Wood, however, was adamant that he was not mocking the country values of small Midwestern towns. In fact, he was cherishing them. I had to go to France to appreciate Iowa. However, not everyone was convinced. A lot of people, including Gertrude Stein, thought that it was clearly a satire. For them, the house's style was the perfect representation of how out of touch these people were with the world at large. Their conservative values isolated them from a world that was progressing at a breakneck pace. Since the East Coast intelligentsia framed the painting subjects as representatives of a backward lifestyle, there was a clear polarization. And do you know what polarization does? It brings more eyes to the work. While the entire nation was fighting over the meaning behind the work, the artist was adamant that it was an homage to the rural community whose drive and labor were crucial for the country in such a difficult hour. Over the years, American Gothic has become a symbol of the steadfast American pioneer spirit. Wood painted several country landscapes after this work like these, all showing his love for the countryside. He also painted some political pieces like the Daughters of the Revolution, 1932, which he claimed was his only satire. That painting in the background is Washington crossing the Delaware. Notice how the cup-clinking housewives cover it up. None of his other amazing pieces gained as much exposure as American Gothic. That one painting struck something at the heart of American discourse on national identity like no other. Today, it's one of the most parodied works of art in the entire world. Oh, and the painting that won first prize at that Chicago competition. Nobody knows about it, not even me. Do you like American Gothic? Do you hate it? Let us know in the comments. And don't forget to like and subscribe. We'll see you in the next one.